Well, as they're making their way back uh, to the seats, before we jump in the Word this morning, I want to let you know about a few things that is, that's going on. Next Sunday, uh, the, uh, the 13th at 12 noon after service, we have Welcome Home after service, but then after that, we're going to have something called an Outreach Info Meeting. Okay, so I know that we've been talking a lot about the food pantry that we've got going on. We were able to, uh, well, I think we're almost up to like 500 bags of groceries just in this community over the last few few months. And it's been such a blessing to be able to, to love and to serve our community um, like we have. An amazing team making that possible. But, I, I, you know, outreach is not just something we do. Outreach is who we are. Jesus, um, church doesn't have a mission. Jesus' mission has a church. And so, like, it's what we've been called to do is just be an outreach. And so what this meeting is about next week, and so if your heart is stirred at all about reaching this community, reaching your community, um, I ask you to stay back. We're going to provide lunch. um, But what we're going to do is just explore opportunities about what it looks like for us to be that church that really loves and serves its community well and opportunities for you to be the church in your community too because that's that's what it's really about is us taking... We're, this is just the rally. This is just the party. Have y'all had a party this morning? Like I'm... I'm just, this is, it's just been amazing this morning, but this is the party. This is the rally. This is the, hey, we're doing this thing. And then the goal is, just like this is a warehouse that the Lord gave us, we're shipping people out. We're shipping, we're being shipped out. So when you leave this place today, I want you to think, I'm being shipped out to actually be in outreach, okay? So that's happening next Sunday at 12 um, after service. Lunch is provided, but we need you to register so we know how much food to prepare for. And you can go to the dwellingchurch.org and just click on that upcoming events button if you scroll down, and that should be uh, listed there. Also, next week, our dwelling communities are kicking off. If you uh, if you've not signed up for a dwelling community, it is open, and you are there. Are, we are taking registrations for dwelling communities. This is how we do groups around here. Yeah. Okay, so what we what we've done is we've built a just a geographical structure where there's a home somewhere near you where people gather on a weekly basis to just pray together, worship together. We actually take communion together. And then you, we just encourage each other and grow together. And this is, you know, when you come on Sunday, there's just a few people that get to play, right? But in the homes, in communities, what the church is actually supposed to look like is everybody gets to play, okay? And so that's why we push that is in every one of our groups are family friendly. And so you just show up. No, no, no register first so we know you're coming, you know. But, but get in a community. I know we've got two in Pooler, Georgetown community, the South Side, Islands, downtown Midtown. We've got a Berwick community. Help me out. I, I always forget. Bradley Point, I always forget Effingham. I'm so sorry, Effingham people. I don't mean it. I just, you're just up there, you know. It's, just, it's out of my line of sight. Okay. So get plugged into Dwelling Community by going to the website, thedwellingchurch.org. Again, scroll down, find a community. There's a button on there. Find a community, and you'll see all the groups listed. Get in a community. If Sunday morning is all the church you get, you're not getting all God has for you. Yeah. Just being honest, okay? That's, you need to get plugged into a smaller community where you can grow. All right. Prayer nights happen this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. right here in this room. We're going to be praying over those communities and community leaders um, that we'll have just a wonderful group semester this this year, this semester. All right, so we're starting a new series uh, today. We're going through the book of Ephesians. And we've only done that one other time. We did Galatians, and we kind of, we didn't go verse by verse. We kind of went chunk by chunk, you know. But this, this series, we're going to go verse by verse through the book of Ephesians. And so in five years, we'll be done. And... Uh, <laughs> Your kids will be out of the house, and you're, we're in Ephesians 6 now. Um, but the title of this, of this series is called Glory. Everybody say that, glory. glory. Come on, glory. Come on, somebody say glory over here. Glory. 
So we're gonna make a lot of headway today, okay? So I need you to just bear with me. We're going through two verses, okay? <laughs> two verses. So Ephesians chapter one, verses one and two. Basically, the greeting. You can't get past Paul's greeting. But before we do that, most of my message this morning is background, okay? It is, and most of next week will be background. But I wanna give us the, the framework, the context of what we're gonna be talking about through the book, book of Ephesians and if you were here for our Vision Sunday or our birthday celebration, four years, whoop, whoop, you might remember we talked about 2022 being that word for this year being glory, glory. And our prayer is that we would experience the glory of the Lord like never before, that we would reflect the glory of the Lord like never before, and that he would get more glory this year through us and through this house than ever before. And so glory is the word. And so that's where we're leaning into. And if you look at the book of Ephesians, there's this glory and glorious. It's a glorious inheritance, the glorious grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so there's languages all throughout there. And it's reading through this, it's like, this is, this is the book for the year. Like we, we're just supposed to dig in as a church. I've always done kind of topical messages, but for the, this is really the first time. We're just digging deep. Who's ready to just dig deep? Yeah. Just dig a little deeper. So looking throughout scripture, we see this, this idea of God's glory. Exodus 33, 18, Moses asked the Lord, he said, please show me your glory. And get what God's response was. He says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim before you my name. So just Right, I said get gate this morning. Who heard me say get gate? Right out the get gate. I just made that up, so I'll use it again. Y'all may might catch on, you know. Right out of the gate, you cannot separate his glory from his goodness and his name. He says, show me your glory, and God's like, okay, I'll show you my goodness, and I'll tell you my name. 2 Corinthians 3.18 we all with unveiled faces are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory. From glory to glory. From glory to glory. This is what your life looks like as a believer. So don't be so discouraged that you're not there yet because you're moving from glory to to glory, becoming more like Jesus. And the addictions and the habits are falling off. And the, and the stuff that you can't stand about yourself that you wish would be out of your life. Listen, the more you just focus and walk toward Jesus, those things start falling off. It's like climbing up a mountain. You're climbing, the higher up the mountain you get, the more stuff has to come off. And that's what a pursuit of Jesus looks like. It's just glory to glory. Ephesians 3.16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. And then I've got one more scripture here. It's 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 8. This is one that he's really been speaking to us. And Paul is doing a throwback to Moses. Moses would come down off the mountain with the law of God and his face would be so shining, he literally had to cover it up. He'd been in the glory, and the glory just seeped in. I don't know how that works. But then it started shining out of him. And this is what Paul says. The old way, with the laws etched in stone, led to death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel couldn't even bear to look at Moses' face. For his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way, now that the Spirit is giving life. So <laughs> under the old covenant, under the law, there was so much glory that you were like, Moses, what's up? Where's my Ray-Bans, you know? Like, and under the new covenant, Paul says, shouldn't we expect Shouldn't our expectation be every single day of our life that there's a far greater glory to be experienced, to be reflected, and to give to Him? That's the reality we live in. 
And you say, well, why is Ephesians that book that we're going through? Because I don't know of a, a book that gives a clearer picture of what a life of glory looks like. A church that's a glorious church. A family, a home that's a home full of glory. A victorious glory. And this is what Ephesians talks about. So still in background here, there's two words for glory, two Hebrew words. And this is a little teachy. Y'all good with that? But the good thing is when you leave here, you can tell somebody you speak Hebrew now. Okay, so the first word is kabod. Kabod. Kabod is the Hebrew word for glory. It's this idea of a weightiness, an importance, a, uh, a majesty. Over and over in Scripture, the glory of the Lord. I think about Isaiah's vision. And there were the, the, the angels, the seraphim were flying around, you know, and they, they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. There's this majesty to God. There's this glory. There's this weighty presence. There is this um, just magnificence that creates this awe and wonder in us. For many years, for a few years of my life, I was in a certain um, camp in the church that uh, is more of the Reformed uh, tradition, okay? Now, I don't totally line up with everything in the Reformed tradition, but let me tell you what I got those few years that I was in that church. I got a view of God that was a lot bigger than my buddy Jesus. I got a view of God that he is sovereign, that he is powerful, that he is so other that I, it's almost like it's got, I got this picture of who am I to even approach him? Who am I to even approach the glory, the majesty of God, or think that I'm worthy enough to even be in his presence? And that was a good starting place. Because I don't know if we ever, if we don't ever get there, the gospel is not good news. And so there's one word, kabod. Good, y'all doing good. You sound, sound Jewish. The second word for glory is this, shekinah. Shekinah. Now, you probably heard, if you've been in church, um, especially if you held a tambourine, you probably have heard the word Shekinah glory, okay? Just, just, just thinking. Uh, so, kabod is that weighty importance, that majesty. Shekinah is actually not in the Bible. Did you know that? Shekinah is the Hebrew word that we first find in the rabbinic literature. In other words, it's some writings of some early rabbis, Jewish rabbis. And so what they were trying to do is give us a context of what kabod is all about. And so there's this Hebrew word kabod, the glory of God, majesty, awe, splendor, that whole thing. And the rabbis were like, how do we describe what it means when kabod comes? And so the word that they used was Shekinah. And I love this part. Do you know what Shekinah means? Dwelling. That's cool, isn't it? I love it. God, that we would be that place where you just come, your glory comes. So it denotes the dwelling place or settling of this divine presence of God, the glory, the kabod of God. And so if kabod is the weighty majesty of God, then Shekinah is the nearness of that weighty majesty. The resting place where that presence rests. That's the dwelling place of God. And so you look in the Old Testament, and under the Old Covenant, this glory, this presence, that the early rabbis described as Shekinah glory, would come to a specific location that had been prepared for that glory. So we look at the wilderness, and God says, I want you to build a tent, and I want you to do it like this, and I want a room here and an outside room, and then I want this to go on, and I want the altar here and the basin here. Very, 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 very specific. That's why if you do your year through the Bible, you get kind of lost in the Deuteronomy and Leviticus because it's just like, make it this long and this wide and made of this. And you're like, what is all this about? God's just saying, here's what I want my dwelling place to be. 
because it's very intentional. And if you look at that old tabernacle and you look at later the temple in Jerusalem, it was so specific what God wanted because this would be the place where he would dwell with his people. God's always been a dwelling God. You look back in the garden. As a matter of fact, if you look at even the ornamental arrangements of the tabernacle and the temple, they all point to the garden. It all points to this time. What God's original intention was, was to just fellowship with him. It was sons and daughters in his presence. No curtain, no, no, nothing blocking that love, that affection, that relationship. Sin ruined that. Guess what the ultimate goal of God is for you and me? To restore Eden to us. For us to be restored to Eden. Heaven on earth is what's coming. And it's going to be like Eden again. But we're in, this, we're in this middle ground where we have a foretaste of glory. And so under that old covenant, it was a prepared place, a consecrated place where his glory would come and dwell. But when Jesus came on the scene, his glory didn't change, but it would forever change the way his glory would come and be known, and even be seen. Isaiah 42, God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and he says this, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not share my glory with anyone. There's no person that can handle his glory. There's no person that is deserving of his glory. There is no false God that can have that glory. God says, I will share my glory with no one. Old Covenant, watch this. John chapter 1. John says, the word became flesh and he made his dwelling among us. And we saw his glory. Glory as the only begotten son of the father, full of grace and truth. And I think about Peter, James, and John as they followed him up the mountain that day. And they see the glory of God. Just, it was a throwback to Moses. Jesus' face is shining. He's transfigured before them. And they're like, oh, what is happening? And John is writing, we saw his glory. Fast forward to the garden on the night that Jesus was betrayed and arrested. Listen to the words that Jesus is praying for you in the garden that night. I pray not only for these, his disciples, but also for those who believe in me through their message. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be one in us so the world may believe you sent me. Game changer right here. I have given them the glory you've given me. I will not share my glory with anyone. Father, I've given them the glory you've given me. Do you realize who you are? Do you have the slightest clue what you've become in Christ? <laughs> what Jesus made possible by his spirit is the glory, the kabod of God would not just come to a temple, but now you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are his sanctuary. You are his prepared place. You have become the resting place for this glorious, weighty presence. You are the temple where Shekinah dwells. This changes everything. The dwelling is not a church. The church is is a dwelling. You are a dwelling. You are the dwelling place of God. You carry more than you think. 
Preacher told me one time, when they get quiet, you know that you're breaking new ground. So I'm encouraged by the silence. Because some of you are like, light bulb. I've never heard that. Or I've heard it, but now I get it. It changes everything. It changes everything. And I'm praying right now as I'm preaching, God help me get all the light on that that I can have because I don't live that way all the time. I don't live like I know that and I believe that. But here we go. Worship team, y'all come on up. We're actually getting into Ephesians now, so it's time to close. (laughs) All right. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. So first of all, and I'll talk about this a little more last, uh, next week, uh, about the, just the background of the book and what Ephesus was and all that. But the book of Ephesians is what's called a Pauline epistle. It just means it's a letter written by Paul, okay? And so he was writing a letter to a church in a city called Ephesus, which is up there around Turkey now, where Turkey is, modern-day Turkey. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. The word apostle just means someone who's sent, an emissary, um, a representative of another kingdom, okay? And so what's happened is people have come who've heard about Jesus, maybe on the day of Pentecost, got saved. They were one of those, what, 2,000 or 3,000? 3,000 people that were in Jerusalem. And perhaps some of them went back to Ephesus. Some Jews that believed in Messiah went back to Ephesus. By the time of the writing of this letter, there are 25,000 believers in Ephesus. In other words, the church is exploding in that city. It's a pagan city, Greek city, uh, let, I, I loved, I'm going to, the goal for this series is really not just to go through the book of Ephesians, but to take you through the streets of Ephesus also, so that we see the context of what it was written. But Temple of Artemis and like just false worship, that's, it was culture. Everything about it was wrapped up in false, in an idol. And now Paul's coming in and he says, look guys, I know what you're living in. I see like, I see what you're Walking in every day of your life, I see that you're persecuted. I see that you're misunderstood for following Jesus. It's completely countercultural to you in the city that you are. And he says, this letter's from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle, a sent one to you of Jesus Christ. And get what he says right here. This is where it hits us personally this morning. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus. I'm writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Oh, he opens this letter with not only a blessing, not only an introduction and a blessing, but with identity. He says, in this culture that you find yourself in, you may not feel real holy, you may feel beat down, but the Lord says you are holy, you're a saint. You're not just sinners saved by grace. You're saints of the Most High God. Set apart ones. Ones who have been prepared for a glorious abiding. Do you know that if you are in Christ, these words of Paul describe you too? What you think about that, Holy One? Holy One. Holy one. <laughs> I was in youth ministry for many years and someone come up to me one time and they said, I was teaching on identity and purity and how when we're just as clean as Jesus. You ever heard that? Not because of what we've done, but because of his righteousness. The Bible says he became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We're not dirty anymore. And this teenager comes up to me. She says, 
I've felt dirty all my life because of some decisions that I've made and all that. And what I'm hearing is, for the first time, that God doesn't even see me, doesn't see me that way. That I'm actually pure and that I'm actually holy. And knowing that makes me want to turn away from all that stuff. <laughs> knowing who we are in Christ is, man, it's a game changer. A holy one. It's your identity. And so I could be super religious and I could spend three hours telling you what you need to stop doing and telling you how big of a sinner you are and remind, and remind you of all that you've ever done. Or I could just remind you who you are. You are a holy one of the most high God. You're a saint. Be a saint. <laughs> You're a holy one. Be it. The greatest motivation in my life. Listen, I've had people beat me down with this Bible. I've had me beat. I've had, I've been beat down by religion. I grew up in church. You can't not get beat up by religion if you grew up in church most of the time. But I'm telling you something. The most freeing, liberating thing I ever heard was, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're mistaken. That's not who you are anymore. This is who you've been made in Christ. Now you have the power to live that way. There's mercy. Mercy is forgiveness of sins. Grace is the power to live free. And so this whole grace thing about, well, I can live like I want to now because it's all under the blood. That's not the gospel. That is the furthest thing from the gospel. The grace of Jesus sets you free to live a holy life. And the more you see who you are and the more you see his beautiful face, the more holy you want to live. You are a holy one. So it's not about changing yourself. And there may be somebody in this room today that you're like, I don't, I don't know about this stuff. Like, I don't know. I don't know that I know the Lord. I, I don't know that I believe any of this. I don't know. I grew up in church, but I don't know that I have a relationship with God. I don't know that I've gone too far for God to save me or to love me or to forgive me or to accept me. Listen, it's not about you changing yourself. It's about letting the glory in. And when you get in the glory and when the glory gets into you, it changes you. And so, who is that today? They just, I just, just say, I just need to give my heart and life to Jesus. Would you just raise your hand? We're just going to lead you through a prayer. I see a hand back here. Anybody else? I see two hands, I think. All right. So here's, here's what we're going to do. Everybody stand. And just everybody just pray this prayer. If you raise your hand, you say, I'm ready to give my heart and my life to Jesus. Like, I want to be the dwelling place of God. That's what this is about. It's not about religion. It's not about, it's not about any of that. It's not about doing better. It's about just giving Jesus his rightful place on the throne of your heart. Surrender, glory come. So right now, let's just pray this all out loud. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. I believe you died for me, that you rose again, and that you're coming again. But for now, you live in me, giving me the power to do what's right and to live this life for you. Take my life. Give me a new heart. Change me from the inside out. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on. So, if you prayed that prayer this morning, if you're the ones, ones that raised your hand, or if you didn't, and you, this was the first time you've said, I'm giving my heart to Jesus today. After we dismiss up here, I'm going to be standing right here, okay? And for the purpose of talking to you, okay? And I want to give you some next steps in your walk with God. And I want to pray for you, okay? So I'm going to be standing right here. So you just come up and see me, all right? Don't, so if anybody's talking to me after service, don't get offended when I say, hold on just a minute, you know, okay? All right, so for everybody else, 
Jesus is reminding you. I just believe he just brought us all here today to be reminded of our identity in him. If he's reminded you of your identity today, then you just believe that, you grab a hold of it, and you receive it. It's not a striving, it's not a let me work this up. So everybody just put your hands out in front of you. Just as like a, just a prophetic thing that we're doing with our, with our bodies right now. It's Lord, we receive your glory. We receive the grace to live the life that you called us to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, let's worship.